Hello everyone, today we begin our lecture series on Italian Renaissance and for that purpose we travel to Italy and in Italy we travel to the city of Florence uh, right here and uh, the date at which we travel there is about 1300 AD and at that time we find this little town and um, it was, uh, it was busy, it was bustling, it was money-making, everybody knew one another, and uh, it had guilds. All professions were organized into guilds, and uh, the big four guilds really ruled the city, and they included the uh, Notaries Guild, which was sort of a bo today's bar association, uh, which included advocates, lawyers, judges, notaries. Then, of course, there were the dyers of uh, foreign wool, which was extremely important. Then there were the bankers, of course, and wool itself, and the, um, uh, the Guild of the Wools. And, um, and then there were very many lesser guilds, including apothecaries, and uh, our painters will be part of the Apothecaries Guild because the Apothecaries grinded their colors for them. But those four pretty much ruled the city. So, and they exercised uh, the functions of kind of a, tra uh, a trade union and um, an employers association all at the same time. And, um, and as I said, everybody knew everybody else in the city and uh, the gold florin was in fact an international exchange. They, they had a great deal of civic pride and they expressed that civic pride around 1300 in municipal building. In fact, they had already projected a great new cathedral, they've projected um, a new church uh, for Santa Croce, for the Franciscans, they've projected a new city hall, uh, the new walls uh, around the city, here it is, there we have our Fiorenza, new walls around the city, the cathedral was projected, uh, so was the new town hall, uh, Palazzo Vecchio it will be called, and then uh, Santa Croce is there, and uh, by this time already they had Santa Maria Novella, which was uh, a Dominican church. And, and, of course, they had the baptistry from much earlier, where every newborn Florentine was, um, was baptized. And, um, and these people were, they were hard-headed, full-blooded, ambitious, and very, frankly, devoted to the um, money-making. Except that the wealth for them really was a step towards fame, and fame was important. And in this respect, a painter became very important because a painter could provide recognition in this life and also help with recognition in the next life. And the interesting thing about the Florentines is that, um, is that they are the uh, sort of piety, liberty, <laughs> and prosperity. They were, they were all very much uh, convertible terms. Um, so for, for a very wealthy Florentine, uh, it was as natural to commission a chapel uh, from a painter, a painted chapel, frescoed chapel, as say for a very wealthy American to acquire a fleet of brilliant cars, old cars. And uh, they very much believed that uh, a saint could uh, help them in this life and uh, very much help them in the next life and uh, they really very much needed a painter uh, because uh, it really paid to do honors to to the saint. Um, we have to remember that many couldn't couldn't read and write and since the uh, <laughs> since the church has ever been merciful uh, as regards uh, sermonizing. Those who couldn't read and write could read those sermons in pictures. 
sort of as our children when uh, they still don't know to read how to read and write. They obviously we, we show them a picture book. Now this this whole sermonizing was of course common to the entire Christendom. But it just so happened that the Florentines at this point wished for better painting. They appeared to have moved ahead of the world in um, towards um, finer, more, more passionate, more conscious experience of life. And, uh, and the older painting was just not satisfactory at this point. Um, a couple of things happened uh, prior to the year 1300. And here, perhaps you can see better. And then, of course, you will receive the PowerPoint, so you'll be able to compare the lecture to the PowerPoint. And if you see them together, if you watch them together, you'll see it much better. Here is the cathedral. There is our Signoria, Santa Maria Novella, uh, the Great Walls, of course, and the and here is the river, Arno. And here there are just imaginative recreations of what of what that um, city may have looked like. And uh, and as I said, they were busy, they were hard-headed, they were very practical, very pragmatic, and um, they didn't see any problem in making money for the glory of God and the saints, and of course for themselves. Um, well, uh, about a hundred years before, around the year 1200, there appeared two remarkable leaders, two new remarkable leaders in the church, and one was Saint Dominic, and one was Saint Francis. Now, Saint Dominic, with his disciple Thomas Aquinas, they wished to make Christianity more reasonable, uh, more rational. In fact, Thomas Aquinas went out of his way to try and reconcile Christianity with the older Greek philosophy with Aristotle, whose writings by that time were, were available in Europe. It's very much, he was, no one was ever better than trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. <laughs> That's true, but, uh, yeah, he makes but the it attempt work. met it. Oh, no, not just the attempt, I mean, he made it work. I mean, uh -huh. you read Thomas Aquinas and you think, wow, you, you really just bent this over backwards to fit into one another. I mean, well, wow, well that, done. it's amazing. Sasha is here. She's been with me through the entire pandemic, thank God, because she's responsible for all this YouTube, Zooming, I would have never been able to do it by myself. And she's also my audience and my daughter. So, at any rate, so Saint Dominic attempted to uh, make Christianity more reasonable, and Saint Francis attempted to make it more heartfelt and, uh, and passionate. So, while one supplied the light of reason, the other supplied the light of the heart. And both, they roused the church sort of out of its dogmatic slumber, and the Florentines very much answered to those two calls. Uh, men's hearts uh, now had to be touched, and men's minds had to be convinced and um, the whole idea of just threatening into obedience just didn't work any longer. So with this uh, came uh, with this religious revival and commercial revival and also came the literary revival in the um, form of uh, Dante. Uh, this religious revival exercised great influence. But even a hundred years before that, around the year 1100, there began the phenomenon of crusades. Sort of the medieval answer to the Grand Tour. And as a result of these crusades, which pretty much lasted for 200 years, the Europeans began to go to the East 
And as they went to the East, their eyes were completely open to a remarkably different way of life. They encountered the uh, culture of Constantinople, they encountered the cultures of Islam, they encountered completely different cultures, completely uh, different aspects of art, of life, of consumption. They brought it back with them and this inaugurated a whole new age in trade and travel. So between, between this commercial revival and the religious revival, there also came an intellectual revival. And now, and now we go to art as it was inaugurated by Florence. Well, Leonardo will later say that picture is good only when the movements are appropriate to the mind that promotes that movement. In other words, significant emotion must be conveyed by convincing mass. And uh, that is the kind of problem that began to occupy Florence from the time of Giotto, about the year 1300, till the death of uh, Michelangelo. And Florence was in the forefront of, um, of this investigation. So they had two aims, and one aim was humanistic, in which case was the mastery of emotion, and the other aim was scientific. In, a, uh, in other words, vividly to express mass where there is no mass. In other words, vividly to express uh, sculptural significance, which is three-dimensional, on a wall, which is two-dimensional, or on the panel which again is uh, two-dimensional. And in this, Florence will begin to regard itself almost like classical Athens back in the 5th century, except where... And, and Florence will regard um, her gods, uh, the God, the Father, and the Son, and the Virgin Mary, and the Holy Spirit, and the saints. We shouldn't be forgetting about the saints. Very much as the Greeks uh, regarded the Olympians, just the supreme examples of humanity, and that is how they will portray them, just as uh, men and women of the noblest type. And all of this immediately increased the sum of fine thinking, feeling, seeing, which really underlines all, uh, all great art. And here we have now, before Giotto, there was an artist by the name of Cimabua, who was still seeped in Byzantine tradition, which existed in, um, in the West, which was imported from Byzantium, and which was rather decorative, spectacular, uh, two-dimensional, and which did not truly have that, um, that point of... Um, significant emotion married to significant mass, even though they did try to portray significant emotion, but they tried to portray it not through, not so much through humanistic approach as in terms of luxury and opulence, as a celestial vision. And thus we see uh, this icon right here, and uh, we see the Madonna with, with the Christ child. Christ child looks very much as pretty much an, an old man and the relationship between the Madonna and Christ child essentially non-existent. Then appears Cimabua, who still very much belongs to the Byzantine tradition and therefore there is gold in the background and uh, the Madonna is sitting on the throne. The uh, Christ child suddenly becomes more childlike and uh, there is more of a connection at least the Madonna here shows her Christ child to us. She is now also surrounded by a court, by a celestial royal court of beautiful angels. We still don't know how she quite got up on that throne and the fathers of the church are beneath her, but there she is with much more of humanity to her. He also began to do a very different crucifixion. Here is the crucifixion that 
goes back to times medieval and here is the crucifixion of Chimaboa. And again, just bear in mind, significant emotion must be given convincing mass. And this is really a formula for Renaissance art. And we see it much more here. There's an impression of pain and sorrow, which does not exist here. It is, it, there's an attempt at it in his face, but, but his body does not express it. And then in Rome, towards the end of the 13th century, there appears a man by the name of Pietro Cavallini, not in Florence, in Rome. And suddenly we see a, a great change. And that is the gold background disappears, the uh, striations, these lines are called striations that are meant to convey uh, the crinkling of drapery, but as they do not know uh, the art of conveying it through uh, light and shade, at this point it was done through these lines. With Chimabo, while he still has the gold flickering, begins to do so, so through light and shade. S and so much more, Cavallini does it. Gold disappears altogether, and these are the Apostles. This comes from uh, a church of Santa Cecilia, Cecilia, in Rome. It's a very long fresco that shows the Last Judgment right here, and you'll be able to see it on your PowerPoint. Santa Cecilia is right here. She was, in fact, this sculpture was created in the 16th century by Stefano Maderno. It's beautiful. I mean, the sculpture as well. Right, it yeah. And, oh, it's very, very sensitive also. Well, she was decapitated, so there is... Um, the there is a, And the hands are tied. It's, it's a very beautiful sculpture. But also just how broken it is. I mean, she right. really does look like a crumpled little bird. Mm -hmm. It's very sensitively yeah. conveyed. You. And she's a patron of music. And she looks almost like a child. I right. Mean, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it's certainly evocative. Yeah, that's in the church proper, and then to the left of the church, one can go uh, at a certain hour and see uh, the Cavallini fresco. And we are looking at these four right here on the left. And as you see, light and shade uh, are now employed. There is no striation whatsoever, and uh, these four apostles assume essentially ro ancient Roman dignity as they sit on their chairs in their ancient uh, Roman togas, almost. And there's no question that someone like Cavallini, living in Rome, uh, could see the ancient Roman sarcophagi with their reliefs of ancient Romans, because all these early figures, early Renaissance figures, are very sculptural. And here they have it. And thus you may compare, for instance, this is a mosaic from the church in Thessaloniki, late uh, 7th, 8th centuries, showing uh, a saint and two donors. And you can see how stiff, how rigid it is compared to uh, the three saints uh, of Pietro Cavanini. So the, um, the comparison is quite extraordinary. And then there appears Giotto, uh, G-I-O-T-T-O. The story in Vasari tells us how uh, as a little boy, he is sat on the road, he has scribbled something in the sand, Chimaboy happened to pass by, liked what he saw, took the boy uh, to his studio and taught him everything he knew, and then, as it often happened, the, the student surpassed the master. And uh, that was quite an achievement because the master was extraordinary as well. And here now we have Giotto's Madonna. By all means, compare her to uh, a Madonna from the 6th century. And again, there's a great deal of rigidity there and humanity here. The Madonna now is presented not as some slight ephemeral being, but as a real woman. You could see how she just picked up her skirts and uh, went up the stairs, sat herself down. Uh, the one thing that would be difficult for her here is to get into that seat because, as you see, the arch above her is much too small, so if she got up, she'd probably uh, get a concussion or knock off the, the arch. Everything else, however, is much more convincing in mass to the intended emotion. 
And here we have it. Uh, this is Chimabua, by all means compare. This is Chimabua, still with gold within a gold striation. And here is Giotto. Uh, these things were commissioned, so he, he had to do the gold background, because gold background was a convention. But he removed all gold striation from the Madonna herself. The uh, bit of a gold that we see is uh, on her garment and around, uh, around her blouse just to convey the glorious fabrics that she does wear. She looks at us, the child is sitting in, in her lap, and the child is all the more convincing. Again, she is surrounded by a celestial court, but in this case, one, uh, one, can, one can perceive that this celestial court is standing on something. They are not just weightlessly flying around, even though supposedly the angels do weightlessly fly around. But in this case, they surround her and they have a convincing mass in, in other words, we can feel that they are standing on something. And uh, same, same uh, the two angels right here. So uh, here is our Madonna, and he, he must have gone to Rome and seen Cavallini frescoes and uh, learned from them because his treatment of drapery is now quite convincing, while with Cimabo, still not entirely. And here you have all three of them. For all we know, I don't know, I don't know when this was painted, but it could have been painted pretty much at the same time because that's how in the 13th century uh, these icons were painted by, uh, by numerous shops, uh, painters' shops, and they painted from convention. They essentially they did not look at the actual human being, which is what Giotto began to do. Giotto also looked, as Cavallini must have looked, at sculpture, because sculpture did survive. No painting, no ancient painting, no Greek painting, Roman painting had survived. I mean, it did in Pompeii, but Pompeii will not be unearthed until the 18th century. As far as Giotto is concerned, he had to invent it all over again. And that's what Vasari will say, in fact, about 15th century Florentines. They will have to invent it again, because while sculpture was there, what was left of it, architecture, what was left of it, was still, could still be perceived. There was no painting. The painting, the three-dimensional painting, with significant mass, with convincing mass. Giotto, the great thing about him is that he is giving that convincing mass. Very sculptural, very heavy. We can feel it. His fame grows fast, and soon enough he is being called to a town of Padua, right there. It was part of the Venetian Republic, or soon, be, soon will become. So right here, Padua, Venice here, Padua there, and there is uh, a brick box of a church in uh, Padua. And uh, this box is called today the Arena Chapel or the Scrovegni Chapel, because Enrico Scrovegni was a son of a very wealthy merchant who perhaps acquired his wealth not always by uh, decent means. And Enrico Scrovegni decided that in order to appease the saints and appease the Virgin Mary for his father's and his own transgressions, the best thing to do is to decorate a church. And thus the church is built. It's a brick box. It's very simple if you look from the outside. Uh, we call it the Arena Chapel because it was built very near an ancient Roman arena and one can still, um, can still see the remains of it today. Or it is also known as the Scrovegni Chapel, after Enrico Scrovegni. And here you see it. This is the western wall. Uh, the churches were oriented west to east, most of the churches. You walk in the west, you walk into the church in the west, and then the altar would be in the east facing towards Jerusalem. Uh, this is west, so this is the southern wall. The southern wall was pierced by windows. Here's our west, the western wall. Southern wall is pierced by windows. Everything else was just plain surface, which was ideal 
for a fresco painter. But uh, Giotto is invited there to depict the life of Virgin Mary, and that, of course, includes the life of Christ. What he does then, he takes the division by the windows as um, his parameters and divides the southern wall into squares and rectangles, as you see, and then he divides the rest of uh, the surface according to the same modules. He then proceeds to paint the life of the Virgin Mary in the uh, upper register, then life of Christ in the uh, middle register, and the passion of Christ in the lower register. At the bottom, at the ground level, he will paint the um, vices and the virtues. Also, all the marbling here, that's called so-called grisaille, uh, it's all painted. It is all done in fresco. So this is the view from the altar towards the west, and what we are looking at is the Last Judgment. This, on the other hand, is the view from the west, as we walk in from the west, towards northeast. So there's the altar and the arch of the altar, and there is the northern wall. Now, on the arch of the altar, right here, chancel wall with the Annunciation, we see God the Father on his throne, who is attempting to decide what to do with this humanity that's, uh, that's gone uh, Amok and uh, is uh, no longer obedient, whether to destroy it or to save it, and ultimately he decides to save it. And in order to do so, he sends an archangel, whose name is Gabriel, the archangel, he sends him to earth to announce to the Virgin, and here is our Mary, that uh, she has been blessed, here are the two of them, that she has been blessed with uh, godly attention and that she uh, uh, will from now on uh, bear a child. Now the Virgin, we must understand, the Virgin is about 13 years old at this point and uh, usually see she's portrayed as, um, as sitting in the temple reading her book. And here appears this man with a couple of wings attached to his back and essentially tells her, well honey, um, you're going to conceive, you're going to to bear a child. Uh, today, perhaps, uh, well, not perhaps, really, he'd probably in prison, but um, because this is a biblical account, we don't think of it in um, our terms, we think of it in biblical terms. And this is called Annunciation. And this is the moment, the moment, uh, according to the Bible, that the angel's words hit Mary's ear. That is when incarnation happens. Uh, the incarnation of uh, Christ's child inside Mary's body. It is not immaculate conception. Many think that immaculate conception is the birth of Christ's child. No, immaculate conception is the term that will be invented later for the conception of Mary herself. With Mary becoming pregnant by the Word of God, that is called the Annunciation Incarnation of Christ's child in her body. So these are the two of them and what is spectacular here is that not only there is no gold anymore but the way he depicts the uh, architecture is spectacular. He intuitively has found a way towards the one-point perspective. He intuitively found a way of, of um, portraying a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface, and you can see it here, together with diffused shadow underneath, underneath these balconies. Now we have to remember that in fresco technique, one does not mix colors. In fresco, every color at the time was separately arranged, so there couldn't be the mixing of colors. Therefore, one had to be a genius to be able to convey this diffusion of light. It was just impossible to do. But he does manage to do so. And again, both Mary and, uh, and Gabriel kneel in a very convincing, very powerful way. In other words, the mass, their mass is there. 
And it's, yes, it's almost sculptural because, well, he had nothing to look at in terms of, uh, in terms of painting, well, Cavallini, perhaps. But otherwise, one could look at sculpture and one could look, of course, at real people. And clearly that's what Giotto was doing, whereas before him, uh, one just painted as things were painted for centuries before, by convention, without ever bothering to look at uh, whether real people behave that way or not. So here we have again God the Father, the Annunciation, and speaking of creating a three-dimensional space. He also painted these two little chapels underneath, right here. Here you have them. I mean, he clearly, these, these were the show of skill, the show of absolutely tremendous skill. These two do appear as if they, they have the one-point perspective, which will not be uh, calculated actually until the, uh, the 15th century. Uh, whereas here we're looking at things that were done in the very early 14th, about 1305. And, uh, but, but we're looking into real convincing spaces, which here is almost miraculous. Well, definitely was miraculous for that time. So here we have it. Upper level, life of the Virgin. Middle level, life of Christ. Uh, then uh, the lower level, the passion of Christ and the vices and the virtues right here. We can look at them very quickly. Here, for instance, well, there are seven vices and seven virtues. And quickly, and each of these are divided into the subgroups of three plus four, uh, which are significant numbers in the Christian tradition. Three, three uh, the Trinity, four, the four Gospels, etc. The three theological virtues are faith, hope and charity. Being theological, they are more important, at least, well, <laughs> in religious circles. And the four cardinal virtues, so they are theological and they're cardinal, and the cardinal virtues derive actually from Plato's Republic, and they are somewhat more difficult to interpret. Temperance, prudence, justice, fortitude. Um, yes, difficult. And here we have charity versus envy. Here charity and here is envy. And uh, Jota did these, as I said, sort of in grisaille that, that uh, looks like uh, sculpture. Not only he used sculpture to portray the real human beings, but he also used scul uh, sculptural imagery to portray these. And here we have here the vices. The vices are, we have three spiritual vices, pride, envy, and wrath. And then followed by the much more, <laughs> much more agreeable corporal vices and corporal sins. And they are sloth, greed, gluttony, and finally, of course, the good old lust. Uh, and in this case, we have hope right here, spes versus desperation. And now we go to the actual portrayal of uh, the life of Virgin Mary or uh, the life uh, of Christ. And uh, we'll just look at, um, at several frescoes and then we'll proceed to the Last Judgment so we can fit all of this into one hour. Here is the kiss at the Golden Gate. This is the Immaculate Conception. As I said, this um, the Immaculate Conception will not really uh, appear as um, a phenomenon until maybe the 12th century when, uh, when Virgin Mary will become very important in, um, in theology and then the church will, uh, will decide that well she must be conceived uh, purely as well and in this case this is the story of her parents of Virgin Mary's parents and their Anne and Joachim they were separated they didn't have children for the long, long time, and then they were reunited at the new golden gates that Herod the Great built uh, at the temple, and at the gates they kiss, and it is with this kiss that Anne became pregnant with Mary. That's what Giotto portrays here. The two of them are meeting at the golden gate, and they're kissing, and what is absolutely tremendous here is the 
is the amazing tenderness between the husband and wife. The way he hugs her, the way she holds his head, the way the two faces essentially become one. There's so much emotion in it, in addition to his tremendous technique of portraying real humanity. When this chapel was painted, mobs came to see it. It was maybe comparable to maybe when a hundred years ago the moving pictures were invented and it was such a miracle. This was the case here. Uh, passion plays were of course conducted throughout the Middle Ages and in Italy as well, but no one had ever seen it depicted on a wall with real people. So this must have been a tremendous miracle. So this is one. Another fresco is the is Judas Kiss. And here the composition is brilliant. The composition is very balanced. In the middle stand uh, uh, Jesus Christ and Judah. And Judah has these devilish features. His betrayal is entire. In Europe, color yellow was uh, often uh, equated with betrayal. And here Judah is wearing his uh, yellow cape and he is enveloping Christ in that yellow cape. They are looking each other eye to eye. Everybody around is fascinated as uh, uh, what, what Giotto conveys here is the same kind of fascination with human frailty and, and human tragedy. I mean, even when we drive down uh, a highway and God forbid there is uh, an accident the traffic slows down because everybody wants to look and here's that same fascination uh, on each side of them on the one side is Peter who is cutting a year of the Roman right here on the other side is high priest Caiaphas who finally caught that man and he just can't believe it and then the rest is Head clusters. Uh, head clusters were used in medieval art to convey a large group of people, and that's what you have here. But as the head cluster empties into our space and we begin to see the people, we see their amazement. Not only we see their amazement with their mouths open, but the two of them, the two soldiers, literally stick their noses in between to see better. And what also Giotto begins to do is he turns some people with their backs toward us to convey the real mob instead of just having everybody face us. So he creates a real crowd, a real emotion, a real uh, remarkable event. And the two of them, you can see the, uh, the face of Judah. And... Uh, facing this uh, Apollo-like, uh, idealized uh, face of Christ. And here is the example, here's a mosaic, also Judas' kiss, and you can compare this and this. And you can see how humanity that was used to this representation was absolutely stunned by, by that. And, and even the colors, they're so bright, whereas uh, uh, fresco, fresco painting is watercolors so and as such uh, they are awash they're, they, they're blonde colors as they call it but here he manages to create very intense colors and then another uh, fresco from the uh, uh, from the walls is uh, the so-called lamentation that is also a very important well all those frescoes are very important but the ones I show you really just hit the nail on the head and this is uh, Christ, he's been taken from the cross, he's surrounded, again, there are women with their backs to us. Uh, the, uh, Mary is searching for life in her son's face. Uh, Magdalene is holding his feet, he almost looks as if he's levitating. And then this tremendous uh, device of a uh, rock. Now, all of this, obviously, well, this was done in the chapel in order to paint the rock. One would just bring a piece of stone into, in, in, into the chapel and uh, they paint it from there. But the device of this rock is that it has, uh, it has a purpose. It leads compositionally our eyes directly to this group right here. Here, I found this uh, 
this darkened image of the uh, of lamentation and what it does here this is what this device does it leads our eyes to this lightened space to Mary and Christ this is the most important part and uh, that's what Giotto does compositionally it also divides somewhat diagonally the space into human action and heavenly action but the angels here too uh, very, very expressive. And a number of them are done in a technique called foreshortening. And what that means is that, well, here's my Russian spoon. And um, you can see the entire length of it. But if I turn it towards your field of uh, vision, it becomes shorter. If I turn it like this, you don't even see the stem. And this is called foreshortening. And it's a device that once you put an object at... Uh, at an angle to one's field of vision, then uh, a painter can express recession. And that is what's done with these angels here. So he employs a great deal of foreshortening. Same is true with these uh, women. And what we see here is a great, again, the colors are lovely, but the colors are subordinate to form. Uh, the most important aspect for Giotto is to convey form through mass and then the color comes secondary. And here is Mary who, as I said, is, is no mother can believe uh, the death of a child. She's still searching for the sign of life here and uh, Magdalene is crying. It's so heartbreaking. It really is. It's yeah. so John, the favorite uh, disciple who is beyond himself right here. Meanwhile, we see the two apostles here, perhaps Peter and James, who are kind of standing on the side, twiddling their thumbs, uh, looking at it, saying to themselves, mm, well, maybe it's our time has come now. And all of this conveyed. And of course, the angels they're screaming their hearts out. Um, interestingly, the tree here, perhaps the tree of life that uh, died with um, the original sin and uh, now that Christ is the new Adam the tree of life will bloom again and here uh, it almost looks as if it's sprouting little leaves and the angels screaming their hearts out and thus well these are the examples of the frescoes on the walls and thus we go to the part that's most fun, and that is the Last Judgment. And the Last Judgment is on the western wall. We have, uh, we have Christ in the center, right here. And as was customary, on his right are uh, the Blessed, who will be admitted to the realm of the Blessed. And on his left are the Damned, and the Damned will be thrown into hell. And here sits Christ, he, uh, he is looking towards the Blessed. Uh, it is divided into registers as was conventional, in fact, in, uh, in medieval mosaics. Directly underneath Christ are the two angels right here that are looking at us. Then there are three angels here who are receiving the arena chapel that is given to them by Enrico Scroveni, right here he is with a helper in order for them then to convey it further. Here you have it. Here's Enrico Scroveni with a monk uh, and they are holding up the chapel. The monk is doing a much better job of it uh, so that the chapel would later be presented to, to Christ and, uh, and to his mother. Usually in portrayals of uh, of the Last Judgments. Uh, the, uh, the portion that portrays the Dan, are, those portions are much more interesting than the portions that uh, portray the Blessed because, well, the Blessed are usually uh, very much the same. They, uh, they're all virtuous, they all do the so-called right thing and um, no one can... Uh, and they're usually rather boring. Whereas, of course, the, um, the ones on the other side, the, uh, the damned, uh, that's, when, uh, that's when fun begins. What we have to remember is that uh, 
At this point, Dante seemingly came to visit uh, Giotto, and um, Dante was reading his Divine Comedy, and there he finally established uh, the uh, the principle of retribution in hell in his nine circles. Because until Dante, no one really knew uh, well which sin was uh, was truly uh, uh, dreadful and which was uh, not so dreadful. You. Uh, Perhaps you're unfaithful to your wife. Is that the same as betrayal? Well, Dante decided no. I mean, being unfaithful to your wife, it's, it, it's all right, since he was all the time. And um, uh, those could be placed in purgatory. But if you are a Brutus, for instance, who uh, betrayed Caesar, then you just uh, fall into the last, the ninth circle of uh, hell. And thus he uh, classified all, uh, all sin which was uh, very convenient for Giotto, and Giotto uh, thus established his principle of retribution in hell. In other words, what you did on earth will be done to you in hell. Um, at, the, uh, at the bottom sits Satan with the worst, with the worst sinners in his mouth and, and his hands, and then things develop around him. Uh, here, the blue, the blue devils are pulling down the sinners, and from also from Christ, here, as you see, flows the river of fire. And it's in that river that, that things are happening. Here, you can see here that they're all tumbling down. Uh, this also is an opportunity for Jota to portray nudity because we may recall that Christianity forbid the portrayal of nudity. But then uh, they were sort of cornered with the depictions of hell, because in hell uh, sinners are in the nude. So Giotto uses this opportunity very much to portray nudity in all its um, details. Here, for instance, you can see uh, the details very well, and you'll see them even better when you get your, your PowerPoint. Um, uh, the poor devil, and they're mostly monks, a lot of these people are monks, well women, I don't know about nuns, but you see women, but the males are usually monks, as you see here. So I don't know what he did with his genitals, but they're being pulled on by these uh, huge pliers, which obviously could not be very comfortable. Uh, well, this is a female, and whatever this devil is about to perform on her, again, is, uh, is uh, rather unpleasant. Uh, this man uh, has his hands tied up, and his tongue is being torn out of him. Whatever he did with his tongue, we can only imagine. Uh, more of the same here. And yes, Dante, of course, the principle of retribution, as I said. And then we go, there are some people that are strung up there and some more here. Oh, here, this is, uh, this is the image that we are concentrating on here, right there. There's a people who are hung up. And, uh, and here we have one man whose uh, intestines uh, have been, uh, whose uh, abdomen has been cut up and intestines are falling out. Now, he portrayed uh, Judah very much uh, beastly in his fresco, but here he portrays another aspect of Judah because there is an apocryphal story, in fact, that it was Judah and not John who was the favorite disciple. And when the question arose that, uh, in order for Christ to deliver humanity, he had to be betrayed. Somebody had to do the dirty work. And, uh, and he felt that the only one of his disciples that he could entirely trust was in fact Judah, who would have to do the unimaginable and for his sacrifice receive nothing but hatred from future generations while uh, Christ's sacrifice, of course, will make him a deity. And that's how it happened. And then Judah had to do what he had to do. He couldn't live with it. He uh, cast away the, uh, the 13 pieces, and then he disemboweled 
and hanged himself. Uh, and that is what uh, Giotto depicts right here. And uh, there are other depictions of that as well. And of course, it's, um, it's, rather, it's a very different point of view, but the point of view that, might, that makes sense. I mean, somebody did have to do it. Then we have uh, more people who are, who are hanged. This monk here, again, is hanged by his tongue, uh, just as with the example that we saw before. There's something these monks did with their, with their mouths, with their tongue, that Giotto clearly felt had to be punished. A woman is hanged by, uh, by her hair. Oh my goodness. These two, there's a male and a female, and they are hanged by their genitals. Um, and here we have it. And, well, uh, compare uh, all the stuff that's going on in hell with the, uh, uh, with the uh, right side of Christ, with the blessed, as exemplified by these angels. Well, obviously, everybody wants to see uh, the uh, depictions on Christ's left as opposed to Christ's uh, right. When you look at the fresco, that's a fascinating point in itself. You see that the blessed you see are uh, washed off. In 1966, there was a great flood in Italy, certainly in northern Italy. Much art was destroyed. Young people came from all over the world to help Florence. And in that flood, uh, it was the right side of Christ, the blessed, that were damaged, while all the um, sinners remain intact, which is a very interesting judgment if one chooses to see it as such. And with this, we come to the end of our first lecture on Renaissance, and I wish you a good day, and uh, we'll talk soon.